This week on the Backtable Podcast. So there are now companies that have really long probes that can range anywhere between 19 centimeters to about 26 centimeters. There's a company that has a flexible probe that is even uh, 95 centimeter in length and you can actually thread it in a curved needle system so that you can get to the middle of the vertebra, you can get to the back end of the vertebra without actually needing all the gadgets to get in the back end of the vertebra. You can just thread it via a curved needle also. Hello everyone and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your home for all things interventional and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other major podcast platforms. Feel free to reach out to us on social media with suggestions about how we can improve the podcast and bring more valuable resources to the interventional community. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Want to save time when you order medical devices for your lab? Restock Boston Scientific products seamlessly with Lab Agent, an easy, time-saving device. This free solution allows any user to quickly scan and reorder a Boston Scientific product with a handheld device. Then it arrives with free two-day shipping. Users have saved up to five hours a week. Visit bostonscientific.com forward slash lab agent to learn more about lab agent today. That's lab agent from Boston Scientific. And now back to the show. This is your host, Jacob Fleming, reporting from Dallas, Texas. Our guest this week is a world-renowned expert in neuroimaging and spine intervention and one of the foremost experts in microwave ablation of spinal lesions, Dr. Majid Khan. Dr. Khan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for that kind introduction. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time to be on the show. Really looking forward to hearing about your experience with microwave ablation today. I think that this is a topic that is going to become increasingly more important as the rate of ablation of spinal neoplasms is going up. And we look forward to hearing your expertise and your perspective using this modality. But before we dive into that, I'd like to just hear about your background. So could you tell us a little bit about where you've lived, trained, worked, and anything else? Absolutely. So I did my medical school in uh, Kashmir. That is the northernmost state of India. It's in the foothills of the Himalayas. It's also called Switzerland of Asia, beautiful area. So I did my medical school there, did my internship, finished my internship there, and then came to the United States up in New York, where I did my residency in the Stony Brook program at NASA University Medical Center. And after that, came in to do my neuroradiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins, where I trained under, who still are my mentors to this day, under diagnostic radiology, David Usum, and neurointerventional radiology was Karen Murphy. They are stalwarts in their respective fields, and I was blessed to get training from those guys. After that, as I was a foreign medical graduate, I had to get my green card through, so that led me to Jackson, Mississippi, where I started my career as assistant professor of radiology there, and I really enjoyed my time down in the South. And so I had trained under Dr. Murphy at Hopkins, so I knew the basics of spine intervention, but didn't do it for a few years into my practice. But then as uh, spine care became a part of interventional realm, that's when I realized that it's time to get into this. I was doing vascular interventions still then, and that's when I shifted over to doing spine interventions at, at Jackson, Mississippi. So that was about, I started this around, I would say, probably around 2011, 2012. And just having that basic knowledge of spine interventional procedures, really, you know that there's not much of a fellowship that is being offered. At, in, there are a couple of centers that are offering that, but most centers do not offer. Now, times have changed. Back then, there was nothing really. So you literally had to self-train yourself. And that's how most of us have done is we have self-trained ourselves into doing these interventional procedures. And thank God, uh, it's now come to a point now that it has become a real speciality of its own. And people are really wanting to get into this and make a career out of this. And I'm, I'm so glad and happy to see the interest in from our residents or from our fellows who, who really want to delve into this line. 
I agree with that. Obviously, that definitely resonates with me. And I, I think what you said about the fact that there's basically not really a formal fellowship path compared to kind of the more traditional options in radiology. And it kind of comes down to different experience level in the different fellowships. And so there are some neuroradiology or MSK or even VIR fellowships that have pretty good exposure to a lot of different interventional spine aspects. But I think that'll be kind of interesting to see if we come through with a kind of more formalized spinal interventional radiology pathway. I think it's something that we'll have to move towards. I think that the perspective that the interventional radiologist, neuroradiologist brings to it means that it's different than interventional pain fellowship kind of per se. I think that the clinical aspect is definitely important, but I noticed that you and some of the other experts in this area, people like Jack Jennings, Doug Beal, Dan Wynn, and other people are really doing things that are really fall under the realm of the, the history of IR, which is pushing the envelope a little bit and taking something from the toolkit that's traditionally used for a certain kind of problem and saying, okay, how can we apply what we have available for this patient's specific problem? And I think that's really exciting. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of interest among, like you said, radiology residents and med students for this kind of thing. So I'm really interested to see where that's going to go. I think over my career that I have seen a big shift in it. You mentioned pain and all that. Yes, we do overlap with them. But I think with be it interventional radiology, MSK or neuroradiology, spine tumor ablation is something that is more specific to radiology because of the fact that you do need CT guidance at times, depending upon the doesn't like for augmentation world, really, most of us do it under floral guidance and then and, and that can be done under floral guidance, even, even higher levels. But with tumors, it's a little different. You have to have access to fluoroscopy. You have to have access to CT. I think that's where tumor ablations are probably more specific into radiology practice rather than in pain practice. There are, I have seen a lot of really good pain doctors who do a lot of ablations also, but definitely I would say it's, if I had to put a number, I would say probably about 80-20 when it comes to the spine tumor ablation world between radiology and other specialties. You know, it's interesting. I've just finished up the last four weeks being on the PET-CT service so really just cancer related things all day. And one thing that I had kind of this realization that I think in retrospect, it's a bit obvious, but no two cancer patients are the same. And of course, as individuals, that's completely true. But even when you look at specific subtypes of cancer, the presentation and the location of tumor, multiplicity of tumors, all these things are so different. And they each require, I think, a bespoke approach and really have to have those fundamental skills under fluoro and CT guidance available. I know we're probably doing a lot of preaching to the choir. And the one thing I will say kind of related to that is I think that radiologists are definitely uniquely positioned to continue to be involved in interventional oncology. I think that as a field, we do need to continue to push to be more clinically involved. And I think that there's been more of a movement away from the kind of situation where it's like, oh, well, you know, just send the case to me and I'll do it. These patients are so complex. They have a lot of different things going on. And like Dr. Manfrey has said in a prior episode, just because you have a gun doesn't mean you need to shoot. And so deciding when and whether to do the procedure and then pertinent to this topic today, what tool to use to do it. These are all very important things, and we have to be the ones making those calls. Absolutely. You brought up a very good point in regards to the cancer care and how we fit in. I really think, as we know now, if you are doing intervention of any sort, not only spine, if you're doing body interventions or any, the days of us being involved and just doing the procedure only and then returning the patient back to their referring physicians is long gone. We own these patients as much as they do. So if you get a referral for a patient, tumor, onc, fracture, pain-related, whatever it is, 
you own that patient. That's your responsibility. If you're doing the procedure, if God forbid there's any complication that happens, immediate complication, late complication, that's your problem. You can't be saying, hey, go back to your referring and he'll take care of you. So that brings a very important point that for the modern day interventionalist, two things are very, very important that you have to have your clinic where you see these patients pre-procedure or pre-surgery and post-surgery. So you have to do your follow-up with these patients. And now we are seeing that radiologists are never used to be having access to patient admission. But we need that. We need that at least short-stay admission privileges in hospitals. So that's something if, if a young person is aspiring to become an interventionalist of any sort, spine interventionalist or any interventionalist, these are the things that they should be discussing with their practices or with their hospitals that, hey, these are the requirements of modern-day interventional service to really thrive. You can't be relying on your referring physician. Hey, I got this problem. Can we admit the patient? And this has happened to it. This is from experience that I'm talking. It has happened to us in the past. Like we have, we have really struggled to admit patients even overnight because we had to beg, borrow, and steal from our surgical colleagues or medical colleagues. So because we didn't have admitting privileges. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind these days. Such a valuable point, Dr. Khan. I think that's it's really important. And the skills and knowledge gained during med school and internship are not lost later on. And, and one thing, I do see this over and over again, that some level of incredulity from a specialist outside of radiology who are like, what? IR is doing that? IR is putting in a pain pump? Or I mean, how do they, who sends them the patients? And it's like, this may blow your mind, but interventional radiologists actually are physicians and we're fairly pluripotent and able to learn things, even if those skills may have become slightly atrophic over time. And, you know, admitting a patient and making sure they're well taken care of, it's not rocket science, but it's something that does take a commitment. Absolutely. Just as you said. And I think the nice thing about most of our procedures is typically we're not having complications with them. The recovery is fairly minimal. But as you said, a lot of these, they do need short stay admissions and we need to make sure that the patient has done well, that their pain, if they're having post-procedure pain is, is well controlled. It's been taken care of. Yep. And you know, Again, uh, one more point is that you talked about the referrals where the radiologist gets the referrals and all that. So once a patient comes to you, especially a patient with osteoporosis and spinal fractures, you take care of that patient. You take care of their pain. Trust me, the next time they even have a niggle in their back, you will be the first guy that they will call. They're not going to call the neurosurgeon. They're not going to call their rheumatologist or endocrinologist or PCP. If you have taken good care of their back pain, a small niggle, you'll be the first person who will get a call from them. Hey, can we talk? Yeah, and that's how it should be. I think that's best for everybody involved because as the, just to talk about compression fractures specifically, as an interventionalist who takes care of those, we know that a patient may say, oh, you know, I kind of pulled a muscle in my back the other day, and it, but it's been hurting for the last two weeks. And that causes your alarm bells to go off, whereas the PCP or sometimes interventional pain doc and maybe even spine surgeon, it doesn't kind of hit them in the same way. But for us, we know these patients, they're very prone from minimal to no trauma to suffer these things. And so I think it's really for the best you know, and Dr. Beal, for example, has really built up his practice in such a way that the patients who come uh, for a fracture to be treated, they're followed up long term, make sure that the osteoporosis itself is taken care of. And we know that the patients, just due to the disease state, they are prone to getting more fractures. And so I agree with you completely. The days of doing a vertebroplasty or an ablation and just sending the patient home and wiping our hands clean and give ourselves a pat on the back, it's not good enough anymore. Long gone. For the best, I think. And so... 100%.
Couldn't agree with you more on all those points. I apologize. We got a little bit off on a tangent there uh, with some great topics. I did want to hear about the rest of your path. So you were in the South for a few years, started working on uh, the spine intervention, and then you've gone to a couple different locations since then. Yes. So in Jackson at University of Mississippi Medical Center, so it's uh, the only academic center of the state. So we used to get a lot of oncology care, a lot of tumors would come there. And I would be doing a lot of benign compression fracture or osteoporosis related fractures. And then I would see these patients that, hey, because some of them would get radiation and they would be still complaining of a lot of pain and all when we were used to go into the tumor board and they would say, hey, we don't have much options left for this patient. So that really got me thinking that we do this anyway with benign compression fractures. We should be doing something with these pathologic compression fractures also because these patients are in terrible, terrible pain. And that's really what got me started into doing the tumor ablations. So doing some research back then, radiofrequency ablation as well as cryoablations of the bone tumors was being done. And with good success, especially RFA and the heat-based system was being used. So that's, that's exactly what I started with. So I did cryo, I usually did when you had paraspinal soft tissue mass, not specific bone mass, although we did some osteoblastic mets also. But predominantly, we started out with radiofrequency ablation. And most people who, who do these procedures know that it's awesome. There's a lot of literature behind RFA and, and bone tumors. But there are issues when you get osteoblastic metastasis or mixed density metastasis where the blastic component is more than the lytic component. And RFA has a bit of an issue with that. So what happened is that I think for a month or two months when I started doing it, for that one and a half month period, I got a run of patients with prostate cancer who had osteoblastic or mixed density metastasis. I think I got probably like six or seven of them, one after another. And those of us who have done an osteoblastic match, we know how cumbersome it is to get inside the bone in that ivory vertebras uh, that these patients tend to have. And once you get in, and then once I was putting these RFA probes in, the machine would just stop on me like every minute, every minute and a half, which is inherent to the technology. The bone impedance with these types of metastasis is very high, and then it tends to, at least back then, definitely now, systems have gotten better, no doubt about it. But back then, it was it was like that. If you had a little bit increased bone impedance, the machine would stop on you, so you'd be stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. So that really got me thinking that, don't we have any other system that can be good for these patients with osteoblastic metastasis? And then I researched, and that's when I read about microwave ablation with an electromagnetic wave, no electricity involved with the system. On doing my research, I found out that the bone impedance with microwave ablation is much less compared to radiofrequency ablation. So there was only one company back then that was doing it. So I got in touch with them and I said, hey, I want to try out your uh, technology and see how it does specifically in osteoblastic metastasis. And uh, the results were great. So one thing, again, a technical point here is that if you try out a new modality, especially in tumor ablation, it's very important to keep in mind that when you are doing the case, putting in the probe, heating the probe, doing the ablation, that's pretty much universally the same, be it radiofrequency ablation or microwave ablation, the techniques of the procedure I'm talking about. But in order to get a trust in what you have done and what has actually happened in that bone, you literally have to wait about six to eight weeks, if not more, for you to get a follow-up, predominantly an MRI or a PET scan, and see, like, if I had calculated my burn zone to be three by two centimeters in that bone, did I get that? Did I get less or did I get more? Probably less I can live with in a vertebra. But if I had calculated it to be a 3 by 2 I would never want it to be a 4 by 3 because I can't live with that. As we know, if your spinal cord is there, nerves are there. So in order to get that trust in any new modality of ablation that you're using, you just cannot say, hey, the case went well, and this is a good thing to have in, on my shelf. 
you really have to wait all these weeks and see the ablation zone, what it has done on your follow-up imaging. So when I did that with my few cases early on, at least five cases, I was very happy with the results. The patient follow-up was great. Imaging follow-up of the tumors was great. And I thought that now I do have something in, in which that I don't have to really think about, should I go for cryo just because it's blasting metastasis or should I go for RFA because it is more lytic metastasis? I have something that is actually good for both lytic as well as blasting metastasis. And that's how I landed up with microwave ablation. And I tell you, after that, literally, I've been using microwave for the last 10, 12 years, probably performed the most number of microwave cases in in us definitely i don't know but maybe in the world also and have had great results great results with microwave ablation of my spine tumors we actually published also recently our uh, long-term local regional control our two-year control of our patients who survived their stage four cancer and we saw that the local control at around 18 months to two year two year period of our ablated bones were was really good. So that's very good to know that you have confidence in what you're doing, that it is providing you with what you intended to do for your patient. Yeah, we'd certainly love to share that publication with our audience. And I think it's very interesting that the specific problem of the blastic mitts led you to find what it sounds like now is is really your preferred go-to for for most ablations. Yes, absolutely. Now, I do still do radiofrequency ablations also, but I would say overwhelmingly I am doing microwave ablations. Having said that, I have to tell your audience, especially young aspirants who want to get into this field, that the, the profile of microwave ablation compared to radiofrequency ablation is is different. So, with microwave ablations, the energy or the heat that is being deposited into the tumor cells can go up real fast. So people have to be very careful about the fact. One of the advantages of microwave ablation can also be one of its disadvantages. So because the, the rise in heat, like from 0 to 80, is quite fast, so you have to be very, very careful where you are in, in the bone, how your posterior cortex is. But having said that, one of the biggest, I wouldn't say mistakes, but one of the biggest things that is being thought about microwave as having a profile that is more prone to complications compared to a radiofrequency ablation is that companies, which now there are at least six companies that I know of that have microwave ablation in their profile, but most of those companies are extrapolating microwave ablation probes, which are used for ablating liver or lung tumors and extrapolating the same physics and putting that into the bone, especially in the spine. That is really not how it should be. And I'm very glad I have worked with some newer companies that are coming out with microwave ablation where we have, we're working together. That has to really change. The reason for that is the probes that are you using for ablating a liver or a lung tumor is 2.5 gigahertz. So how does microwave really work? The physics behind that is that when you have these probes that can range from anywhere 900 megahertz frequency to a 2.5 gigahertz frequency. And what it does is that it causes flipping of the hydrogen atom of that water molecule back and forth about one to two billion times per second that that flip happens. And as the flip happens, it causes frictional heat and that frictional heat causes coagulative necrosis of the tumor. So if you are using a 2.5 gigahertz probe, you can realize that because of the higher frequency of that probe, the flipping of that hydrogen atom is much higher compared to if you are using a 900 megahertz probe. And therein lies the difference. And therein lies the difference in the safety profile of different microwave ablation probes. So in spine, you should, if you are doing microwave ablation, you should make sure that you are using a probe 
that is in the range of 900 to 1.2 gigahertz, not more than that. You should not be using a probe that you're using for liver ablation because it's much easier to control the heating profile of a 900 megahertz probe compared to a 2.5 gigahertz probe. And that, I think that really has helped me that I have never had a major complication in, with, with my cases because I always control the heat that is being delivered into that vertebra. I have done cases with, with completely destructed posterior cortex also. Just because I always tend to use this 900 megahertz probe, I control my heat, I, I can control it to 80 degrees, 70 degrees, sometimes I have even gone down to as low as 60 degrees, it increases the time of ablation, but at least I know that lesser temperature is better for that patient, especially if I'm closer to the spinal cord or to a nerve. So that's one very, very important thing to keep in mind, if, especially if you're going to use microwave ablation in your bone tumor ablation cases. The second is, which is universal anyway for radiofrequency ablation or microwave ablation, is that using your protective devices, whether you do active or you do passive uh, protection. By that, I mean uh, putting in thermocouplers. If you are close to the posterior cortex, your posterior cortex is broken, make sure that you have a thermocoupler in the epidural space. Make sure you have a thermocoupler in uh, right next to the neural foramina, right next to that nerve. So that's very important so that you'll get a temperature at the back end where it really matters. We know from data that that thermal injury to neural structures happens around 40 degrees centigrade. So if I have a thermocoupler in and I get a reading of around 38 or so in my thermocoupler, I immediately shut off the machine, wait a few minutes and then go back in again. Or what the other thing that you could do is that if, if you are getting a temperature so high in your thermocoupler, you can always use hydrodissection put some saline in. So with microwave, you can put saline in also. But remember, if you're doing radiofrequency ablation, you never should be putting saline in because of the plasma field effect with radiofrequency ablation. So the only thing that you should be using in that case should be D5W. You can put carbon dioxide in there. You can put air in your epidural space also so that you can get a buffer between the spinal cord or the nerve and the posterior cortex of the tumor. So those are all the things that you can use to safeguard even when you are thinking that, hey, I'm using microwave, I'm not really comfortable with microwave yet. So get these thermocouplers and do the active protection. If you're doing a case under general anesthesia, you can still put thermocoupler in, but you should be doing, especially if, if you have a broken cortex, have your intraop monitoring in place, just like the surgeons do. So you can have your somatosensory evoke potentials, you can have your motor evoke potentials and safeguard your spine, safeguard a particular nerve that you're concerned about. So there are many ways of safeguarding what you are intending to do if you are closer to the spinal cord. In that regard, there's not much of a difference between the safety profile of a microwave compared to radiofrequency ablation. People are more more concerned because there is more literature behind RFA as there is compared to microwave ablation. It's really a new kid on the block. But I'm really glad to see a lot of spine interventionalists now have started to do microwave ablations. Some of my dear friends who were hardcore RFA guys, they have now started to do microwave ablation. And that makes me very happy because it's something that we should have on our shelves and should we should be trying it out especially in our osteoblastic metastasis, and you will definitely see the difference in the profile between the RFA ablation of an osteoblastic and a microwave ablation of an osteoblastic met. Fantastic. So many great pearls there. Thank you for walking through all that. And one of my next questions was going to be about why do you think that microwave hasn't really had a greater adoption in the spine, which you just touched on, kind of new kid on the block sort of thing. And so these colleagues of yours who've who've started to incorporate microwave, what was sort of the, the turning point for them? Is there kind of a typical case where they say, hey, Dr. Khan, do you think this would be a good case for this? Recently, I got a couple of calls from my friends who, who said that, hey, I have osteoblastic metastasis. I really want to use microwave. And they called me up and they said, hey, what, what do you think? What should I be doing about the safety profile? So the first thing I told them was, was this, the probe. That's very, very, very important because you cannot control 
the safety profile of a 2.5 gigahertz probe in a bone, especially in a bone where your posterior cortex is broken. So I told them, select the proper probe. And then honestly, if you have a 800, 900 megahertz probe or even a one gigahertz probe, the safety profile is much, much, much similar to an RFA. That's the point. That's very, very important difference between how, what you select and what the frequency of the probe is. That's very important. Would you say when starting out, say someone who's experienced using RF ablation in the spine, and when starting out with microwave, would you say there are types of cases that maybe should be avoided at first until they're more comfortable with the modality, types of uh, anatomic factors? Just like anything else. The other day, I was sitting with one of my fellows who was going out to be a spine interventional. Actually, he's coming to your hospital at Southwestern. Him and me were talking, and he said that, okay, tell me now if once I, once I get out there and I'm on, on my own, how should I tackle cases? And the advice I gave it to him is the advice I gave it all of our trainees is that the first five or six cases that you do, make sure that you're very comfortable in your own space doing those cases. You should not be cajoled into accepting a case early on in your career that you are not comfortable doing. And the reason for that is that if you get a complication in your first five cases, trust me, you'll hit that modality. You're not going to do, you'll you try to shy away. And this has happened to me. This has happened. A couple of my fellows who went out there, unfortunately had some complications in their first couple of cases and they were like oh no I don't want to do it now anymore so you don't want to lose that confidence very early on in starting your career so select your cases very well be confident about your cases and that's exactly the same I would I would say with microwave ablation you don't have to do your first case with a blown out posterior cortex or a blown out lateral cortex right close to that neural foramina. Select your cases, get your confidence level up. And once you get your confidence level up, it's you telling yourself, hey, I can tackle this one now. No one else should be able to tell you, oh, do this C7 with a broken posterior cortex. That should come from inside of you. No, I have done many now. I can easily tackle this case and do this because I have everything set. I know what's the profile of my device, what are the things that I should be using. And so it should come from inside. And the more you do it, the more confident you will be in a modality and better you will get just like anything else in life. Great advice. I think that's so important, especially in this area where there's new tricks and, and new modalities available seemingly constantly. It's exciting to use the new thing. And in some cases, the ablation modality might be that. But having the, the confidence and knowing that you're not pushing the envelope too much, because like you said, obviously the patient safety is really the most important thing. But there is another casualty when there's a complication and that's for the physician and their association with it. And so, you know, for example, I remember hearing one story when I was in med school about a vascular surgeon that their first carotid endarterectomy outside out of training, the patient had a stroke. And unfortunately, you know, that's the profile of that procedure, which is great. It's, it's one of the known complications. It statistically will happen at some points. But for that surgeon to deal with that is their very first procedure on their own and having to deal with that, that is a Herculean task to work through and build back up the confidence. And it harms other patients in that this physician who is probably technically very good no longer feels safe offering microwave or, or whatever it is to their patients. So I think that's such valuable advice to kind of start slow and build up the confidence and go from there. Like you and I were talking about a few moments ago, these oncologic patients are so different. And just because a patient does have, like you said, a C7 tumor, it doesn't mean that it needs to be ablated. And if it's something that can be done and can be done safely, and the interventionist is comfortable with that, then that's a great thing. But sometimes better to say no at a given point in time. Very important. Let me add two more points. You brought up a very good point that whether something should be done and is needed for a patient. And that brings me to a very important point. Tumor ablation world is 
the concept of oligometastatic disease versus diffusely metastatic disease. So if it is, remember, even if you have one med, it's a stage four disease, right? You doing something is not going to cure the patient. But if you have a patient with diffusely metastatic disease, your goal is pain palliation with all the interventions that we do in spine. Pain palliation is our number one goal. But in a diffusely metastatic disease, we know that if you have 10 mets up and down the spine, ablating one met in L3 or whatever level that is, it's not going to do anything for the patient, unfortunately. So in those cases, really, you ought to be not ablating unless there is a, there is a very, very convincing reason for going in and ablating, especially if there is a lot of retropulsion. The surgeon is not going to do the surgery just because of the patient's survival is, is not that good. That surgery is not indicated. In that case, if I am going to, in a retropulse vertebra, if I'm going to put cement in, I would rather ablate it first rather and then, then put cement in because I don't want to cause more retropulsion. So there are certain scenarios, but they're far less common. Uh, I would just be doing augmentation or whatever pain treatment I have to do rather than thinking of ablation in that patient. Compare that to an oligometastatic disease patient. That's quite different now. We know from our radiation oncology colleagues now that they are with this SBRT, SRS, and all that. So they are very aggressive in treating oligometastatic disease, and that's exactly what we do now with oligometastatic disease. We want to be more aggressive when we treat these diseases. So we are ablating over and beyond what is seen on our imaging as the size of the tumor if it is truly oligometastatic disease. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention about uh, that. The second point that you said that what advice I would give to people early on in the career is that, yes, what I, what I said that, that select your first five, 10 cases very carefully. You don't want a complication in that because that, that brings your own self-confidence down and that will also affect your referral base because first five, 10 cases that you do, that has a bearing on your referral base. They have to get that trust in you that, hey, I'm sending this guy a patient of spine intervention. Results need to be good. So it's really important from your own perspective as well as from your referring perspective that your first five, 10 cases definitely do go well. Obviously, you don't control the outcome in interventional, but you really have, if, you, if your selection is good, you have a higher chance of success compared to uh, if you take a very tough case very early on in your career. Such good advice. And it reminds me of an earlier conversation I had with our colleague, Alan Sog from Duke. And he said, when you're building up a new service line, I say offering something that's, that's new compared to what has been available previously at your institution, such as microwave or cryo or, or whatever the case might be. One of the expectations from the referring providers is that when they send a patient to you, you are going to know when to say no to the procedure. And that just like we were talking about earlier, the old model of interventional radiologists just getting sent cases to do, it really has to go away. And I think that there, you know, there may be some arguments that certain things that we can make. So for example, you know, port placement, our institution has a very, you know, smooth system where the patient gets sent to us, they need a port for chemotherapy. And so they're sent to us. And so we know that they need that access. We evaluate, okay, where, where is it going to go? Are there certain factors, you know, that pa maybe the patient needs a left-sided port because of the side of the cancer and these kind of things. We still provide that workup and make sure that the procedure is being done correctly. But then when it comes to something like an ablation, oftentimes you're going to be receiving consultations for patients where the, the oncologist or whoever may be seeing the patient may just say, I'm just not really sure what to do with this. Maybe they can ablate it and it's okay and it's good to sometimes say no. And I think that one of the things that interventional radiologists have in common across VIR, neuro, and MSK is we like to think about how can we solve a problem? And because we're so exposed to the imaging aspect of it and frequently involved in the multidisciplinary discussions, a patient may come to us and we may say, this is really going to be better served with external radiation therapy. 
and refer it to that specialist. And that engenders the trust that, that kind of builds. And so the notion that you'll walk into an institution and just say, hey, I want to start doing microwave and just go for it. It's a much slower burn, <laughs> just like microwave. 100%. And then and, and that, that's something when you learn when you sit at the table in a multidisciplinary tumor board. You learn that really how a surgeon, if he is not comfortable, will say no. A radiation oncologist, having studied the radiation plans and all that, the previous plans on the patient will say no. We don't think that we will, although they don't have really any interventional type to do, but of course the radiation profile of, on the patient is such that they know that they will cause more harm than good. In interventional radiology, we tend to please or at least try to please everyone by saying yes. It shouldn't be that way. Even at this point in my career, having done quite a few of these, I am not comfortable with doing a case because ultimately it's the patient that we have to think about. We don't have to think about a patient as just a tumor that we can get into and treat or not treat. Are we doing the good for the patient? If this was my mom, if this was my dad, my, my sister, my family member, would I be doing this on her? Because knowing whether, whether this will have a bearing on the outcome. So you, we have to keep those things in mind. We have to start thinking from that perspective. We don't have to just think about, can I get my needle in there? We Trust me, you can get a needle anywhere in the body. But does it help to get a needle in their body? What is the outcome if, you, if we get in there? Is it going to be helpful or is it going to be detrimental? So those are the things that when you are in a multidisciplinary tumor board, you get to learn that a lot. And, and that's also something younger people who are wanting to get into this, especially if you are in a academic center, try to see if there's, if there's not a tumor board that deals with these especially spine tumors and all that, you can be the one that wants to start it. Talk with radiation oncology. Talk with your neurosurgery colleague, your orthopedic colleagues, and start a tumor board. Trust me, everybody wants it, but sometimes nobody, nobody has the will to have that pain in setting this up. But it's very, very helpful. A, it's very good for the patient, and B, it's a safeguard for all us physicians also treating that patient. Yeah, I agreed. And just the more heads we have at the table, the more we can use our complementary skill sets and training to know what's the best to do for these patients. And it's not, spine intervention is not a cookbook. It's an armamentarium we use to, to figure out the, the specific right thing to do for the patient. One thing I wanted to ask about is with microwave ablation, you know, there's several spine uh, specific RF ablation platforms available. There's at least two major companies that, that have them. I was wondering with microwave ablation, is there any spine specific platform or are you using probes and using kind of a cobbled together with a vertebral body access kit. What's, what's sort of your setup and how would you recommend others start to implement microwave? So there are companies out there that have spine specific probes and two major companies are actually working on a microwave ablation system and hopefully we will, we will see them in next maybe year and a half or two years for sure. But right now we have at least two companies that are quite spine specific or bone tumor specific systems that are out there that have predominantly the probes that I'd mentioned in between 800 to 1.2 gigahertz frequency range, which has a good safety profile in there. The probe length is also very important, just like in radio frequency ablation system. So there are now companies that have really long probes that can range anywhere between 19 centimeters to about 26 centimeters. There's a company that has a flexible probe that is even uh, 95 centimeter in length, and you can actually thread it in a curved needle system so that you can get to the middle of the vertebra, you can get to the back end of the vertebra without actually needing all the gadgets to get in the back end of the vertebra. You can just, you can just thread it uh, via a curved needle also. Excellent. And so for some of the interventionalists, say, who have some experience with RF, do you think that there are courses that they should attend or maybe a conference or things kind of to get them up to speed? What, what would you recommend they try to uh, use to learn more before getting started? 
So people who have done radiofrequency ablation, really the basics are the same. So you don't really have to have a specific training just because you're using now microwave. It is, as I said, if you follow the basics, if you do the due diligence in selecting your patient, if you know that you have a broken posterior cortex and you need to have some thermal protection devices in place, that's exactly the same for a radiofrequency ablation versus a microwave ablation. You don't have to do anything, anything different. It's just, I think, really in the mindset of treating physicians that has been drummed into this whole thing, hey, the safety profile of microwave is less compared to a radiofrequency ablation. And I 100% agree, but with the higher frequency probe, not with the lower frequency probe. Lower frequency probe safety profile is equivalent to a radiofrequency ablation. With the added advantages, for example, with the blastic metastases, avoiding the issues of the higher impedance. I think time also is, is something that they, it takes uh, much, much faster to go through a blastic or a mixed density metastasis compared with a radiofrequency ablation. And granted, as I said previously, granted the newer versions of radiofrequency ablations that are coming out there are doing a much better job than what the previous one used to do. But still, microwave has an advantage over that. The other, the other thing I would say, the other advantage that I have seen in some of my patients is you don't need grounding pads with microwave ablations. It is completely compatible with your anesthesia equipment because sometimes anesthesia guys are like, hey, patient has a pacemaker and this and that. So is it going to interfere? We want to interrogate the pacemaker with RFA and all that. So with microwave, it's completely, it does not interfere at all. So you don't have to integrate your pacemaker and all that if a patient has that in place. So those are subtle advantages, but definite advantages in certain cases. One other question I had about logistics, and, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier in terms of the importance of follow-up imaging to see how successful the ablation was and how the actual zone was. Tell us about planning of the ablation zone. Are there tools available with the microwave machine that can kind of give you an idea of what the ablation zone is going to look like, like some of the other systems out there? Or is this something where you need to kind of assume that it's going to be on the larger side and err on, on the side of caution below that? A great question. So unfortunately, we do have thermal imaging capability, but we don't utilize thermal imaging capability yet in tumor ablation most of the time, because MR does take a lot of time. Basically, it's all the all the ablation modalities are similar in how you calculate your ablation zones is that you measure your tumor zone. But as I said, with oligometastatic disease, we are going over and beyond the area that we are seeing, just like our radiation oncology colleagues do their gross tumor volume, clinical tumor volume, and that's exactly the same pattern that we follow now with oligometastatic disease. So if I have a lesion that is in the vertebra that measures say 2 by 1.5, I would go 2.5 by 2 centimeters in oligometastatic disease, so beyond the confines. How do we look into that? I think MRI has a distinct advantage for evaluation of that because just like anything else, you will have some signal changes beyond the confines of the zone of enhancement on an MRI. And so you should try to get as much as you can on based on the MRI PET of course, it shows the everyday and all that, but it doesn't help you to calculate your zone as much, as better as an MRI. And then the follow-up imaging, if you are, use the same modality, pre and post. So don't be using uh, CT on one and MR on the other. So use the same modality, so that'll give you a apple-to-apple -apple comparison of your burn zone and what you ultimately got. And you said about six to eight weeks, is that your typical interval for the follow-up? Usually about eight weeks, eight weeks, yeah. Well, Dr. Khan, that was good. That's all the questions I have on microwave ablation. Any other additional thoughts on the topic? That's pretty much it. As I said, that now if you look at the paradigm of treating metastatic disease of the spine, we interventionalists have gotten on that paradigm. And more people will do it, the higher in that paradigm will we be able to get or achieve. So really, this is something not very really hard to do. With good technique, good initial education, there are now centers all over the country that, that provide, especially especially if you're interested in doing this, there are many people across the country that do a whole lot of these tumor ablations so you can 
and everyone is accessible. You can call them. You can ask them if you have any questions. I get calls from all over asking questions, and I'm very happy to answer all the questions and telling people what I have. As, as I said, we most, most of us have been self-trained, and we have learned from our own cases and our own experiences, and I think that's probably the best way to learn. So we can share our experiences with the younger folks, and anytime, if you have any questions, pick up the phone, email us, and we'll be happy to guide you because we want you to be doing it, whether you are a private practice world or you are in an academia world. We want you to be doing it. It's good for the patients, and it's good for us as a, as a service also. Agreed completely, and I, I'll say my experience has definitely been that uh, you and the others in uh, the, the so-called bone club in the world of interventional radiology are all eminently approachable, uh, have been uh, just incredibly helpful. And it, it's been great being able to have some of you on on the podcast here. I think that the experience that you've had, being able to disseminate that, especially you, you have such an extensive experience with microwave, getting this information out there, I think is really going to get some people to think about how their, their practice might benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you, really, because I, I really appreciate you giving me a chance in doing so. Thank you. Absolutely. And I did want to talk about a couple more topics that I am particularly interested in. This next one, I'm particularly passionate about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to restrain myself and remain dispassionate about this. But I think that you and I are of like minded on this. I've seen cases shared on social media, LinkedIn or Twitter, related to essentially the delayed treatment of vertebral compression fractures. And this is an unfortunate, very prevalent problem. And I just want to hear your thoughts on this. Some of the very unfortunately kind of repetitive things that we see, what do you think is behind it? And how can we, our specialty maybe specifically, but as healthcare as a whole, how can we do better for these patients? Great question, really. And as I said, this is very close to your heart and very close to anyone's heart who is doing spine interventions. I think the answer, the shortest possible answer to your question is education. People still are stuck in the study of 2009, the NEGM articles that came out. And unfortunately, some, some people are still stuck in that study. So, one of my things that I tell my trainees that if you're going out there, arm yourself with the new research that has happened since 2009, because you will end up in a place where someone will tell you, hey, this is not beneficial. We have proven it. 2009 NEGM study has proven it. And unless you or have armed yourself with the newer research that has been done since probably 3,500 level one, level two studies have come out since 2009, and almost overwhelming majority of those studies have said that augmentation is better than non-surgical management, especially in an acute slash sub subacute care setting. There are a couple of papers that have even come out and said that even in chronic phases, which is chronic in the bone wound is anything over three months, is uh, augmentation is better, but definitely no doubt about it. Uh, the acute and subacute care augmentation is much better. Uh, but you re we really have to. It's it's not something that we should take very. Although it is it is personal, but nothing is going to change by us quibbling about it. That's being personal. We have to educate people. Tell them, hey, this is this is so. Giving grand rounds. Go to people. Go to departments. Go to endocrinology, rheumatology, geriatric medicine, neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, give grand rounds, talk to them about, you don't have to talk to them about the procedural details, talk to them about the 2009 papers, talk to them what has, what has happened since then, talk to them what are the modalities that are available now for treatment that have gotten much, much better over the past modalities. And that's really what we should be doing because there are many people out there in this day and age who don't know about osteoporosis. Patient, I'm so surprised. That every month I have patients where they're like, oh, I wish I knew that I had osteoporosis. 
there are APPs that I talk to from other departments that say, we never knew that you can actually put cement in a fractured bone in this day and age. And so it's it's all surprising, but but then I, I look at it that it's it's time for us to educate them. And I, trust me, once you educate them, people are recipient to that idea. It's like ingrown, like just just stuck on those two papers that had huge implications in the augmentation world, no doubt. Huge implications. In the, but we really have to come out of that now and teach people that, hey, this is the experience that we are having. This is the literature behind. We're not just saying it. This is the literature behind what we are saying. And you can change a lot of hearts that way. That's such good advice. And I, I agree completely. I think that it's very easy, like you said, for us to kind of take this personally. So how could they do this to the patient? How could they not offer this? And usually what it comes down to is sort of a, you know, variation of the old term that never ascribed to malice, which more easily explained by stupidity. I don't, I don't think stupidity, but rather just ignorance or l- lack of awareness. And so some people, like you said, All they know about vertebral augmentation is the 2009 sham studies, which showed that they were not better than the particular sham that they did. For anyone who'd like to hear more about that, the series that we had with Dr. Beal last year, we talk about this a fair bit. Joshua Hirsch also has an excellent chapter devoted to this exact topic in the vertebral augmentation book. Fantastic resource. I do think that it's really important it, in the spine interventional world, especially within radiology, it's kind of a fairly small world and we can talk to each other until we're blue in the face about should be this, should be this way, this kind of thing. We just have to understand just in like so many other areas of medicine that not everyone, you know, no one else is operating with the same knowledge that we have about our specific foci. And so I can't agree more that we do need to go out and be educating more, whether that's something like grand rounds or picking up the phone to call to the PCP or the APP and say, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I saw that in your note, this patient who had a compression fracture, their DEXA showed osteopenia, and so they don't have osteoporosis, which is another fallacy and that we have to educate them about things like the clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis. If a patient has had a fragility fracture, they have osteoporosis. So I didn't want to forget this because I think one of the advantages of a person like me, and there are many out there like me who do hybrid things. So I, I have not given up on, on my diagnostic neuroradiology reads also. So I am, I think I'm at a much better place position when I see a fracture, I make that phone call to a referring MD or to an APP if the patient is being cared by an APP and tell them, hey, this patient, what type of pain does this patient have? Is it mechanical? Is it radicular? If it's mechanical, this has a DMI in there or this is this is, looks like an acute fracture on CT and we can take care of it if you think the patient is a feasible candidate. So approach it that way. And then some of the people, oh, you can do that? They say, absolutely, just talk to the patient and we'll, we'll give them a call and we'll, I'll get them in the clinic and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this with the patient itself. And they're happy. They're absolutely ecstatic that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you called me up and you told me about this. I'm going to call the patient right away and you, your office can call the patient. So, so that, that's how it should be in some cases, rather than, again, rather than taking it personally, because that's not going to get us any. I love that. I think that the aspect of the, the advantage that our diagnostic reading provides really can't be underestimated. I, I mean, I, I can't tell you just as a resident how many non-neuro or non-MSK studies I've been reading, just chest CT, abdomen, pelvis CT. And you look carefully and you see that fracture wasn't there on their last CT a couple months ago. And I've witnessed that there seems to be a fair bit of squeamishness among radiologists about recommending things clinically, especially if they may be perceived as kind of benefiting ourselves in some way. And so I think that we kind of need to move away from that. I think that there's no question that there are certainly ways to do that that are maybe a little bit distasteful. You know, for example, a radiologist maybe reads a follow-up on an MRI and says, oh, this is RCC, consider referral to interventional radiology for ablation. I can see how that could be maybe misconstrued in some way, but picking up the phone and calling or sending uh, an epic in-basket or an email, 
in my experience, it's almost never looked down upon. It's looked at as extra help and we should be willing and enthusiastic to, to use that aspect. And especially as you mentioned with Epic, it's gotten so much easier now, just as if you're writing an email, just type it in and then, and then tell them and then and, and, uh, trust me, nine out of 10 people will be happy that you actually did. That. Absolutely. Like you and I were talking about before we started recording the episode. I think this is something that a lot of trainees benefit from hearing about is the, the hybrid between the diagnostic and interventional uh, component. I think people are more ac acquainted to, to hearing about that with VIR, but it's certainly possible with neuroradiology and MSK radiology, even body radiology as well. There are a lot of different ways to get to use both aspects of your radiologic skills and not just in academics as well. So just something I want to throw out there. I do want to get more of my peers and the younger folks thinking about this and thinking about how we can change the mold of what's been accepted as, oh, you can do this, but you can't do this. You can make things what you want it to be. You have to be clear about how you want it to come together and what you're going to do to make that happen. Absolutely. And you will not believe how many calls I get almost every month from different programs across the country. Hey, do you have a, do you have a person who is trained in spine interventions yep. and who does diagnostic work also? We need a hybrid person. Absolutely. It's very in demand. The value of very good diagnostic skills, I think, can't be overstated. It can't be separated from the interventional aspect of, of what we do within our special specialty in particular. I think I personally think, even think that that makes me a better interventionalist. Yes, I'd agree. Because, because I understand the diagnosis of the problem much better and knowing that how I'm going to tackle that diagnostic dilemma in that patient, I, I, my plan is set in motion right there when, when I'm describing it in my, in the impression of my report. You're kind of already thinking, okay, if I had this patient on the table, how am I going to be approaching solving this problem? Absolutely, 100%. And I think it's a really exciting aspect. And so I, I find myself slipping into that a lot, even if it's I'm reading a diagnostic study, say out of the ER, and it's not a, a patient who I'm ever going to be seeing and operating on, but I think about that a lot. How would I kind of approach this problem? What's a way to approach that problem? I think the more that we kind of flex those two aspects of our training, we can think about you know, more out of the box ways to, to solve things. And, and it's, it's not only for ourselves, like thinking about, Hey, whether I can do that case or not. So many times I've, I've read a study, we calculated the SIN score, which most people, diagnostic people are unfortunately not doing when they're reading an onc spine, which every person should be doing is reading an onc spine, calculating a SIN score and then calling up the APP or calling up one of my neurosurgeon colleague, hey, I, saw, I just read this scan, this patient is really needs imaged care. And, and they're happy. They're really happy that, oh, thank you for letting me know. And so it, it's, it's not just, just for us. It's, it's good for patient care. I agree 100%. And I'm sure we could go on all day talking about the different aspects of that. One other thing I wanted to talk about before we end is you're extremely well published, numerous publications to your name, and one of the more recent ones is your textbook, Image Guided Interventions of the Spine. I believe this came out in 2021. Fantastic textbook published by Springer. There's no shortage of textbooks out right now about image guided spine interventions, image guided pain interventions and stuff. This one, I feel like there's, there is something different about it though, but I want to hear your perspective. What was the impetus for putting in all the relatively thankless work of uh, putting together a textbook on something in, in an area where there are so many competitors, so to speak, what was the impetus and, and what did you hope to have it stand out from the pack? What was, was different about this that I really made a conscious effort of getting the leaders in that particular niche to write a chapter on what they have written about. So. From this book, if you will see anyone who has written a chapter, they are known nationally or internationally for doing that particular modality. So I thought that would be a best way to directly hear from the guys who do this day in and day out and have their chapter out and, and, and write it the way they want to, to get their work published. 
Yeah, it's really an all-star cast and really it's extremely broad and deep in the way that it covers these different topics rather than kind of saying, oh, you know, here's how we, you would do an injection or something. It gets very quite specific on things and, and I love how image heavy it is. Yes, so I, I really wanted, that was also a conscious effort to put the diagnostic part of it to have some relevance about the anatomy of the spine and the diagnosis and everything. So that was a conscious effort. And the thing that also I put in is that we usually tend to talk about the now non-vascular intervention. We have chapters in there for vascular interventions also because we, we have our colleagues who are known all over the world for their vascular interventions who have actually written that chapter in there. Yeah, it's it's a great textbook. I think it's a, a great resource to have available. I uh, didn't have the space to bring it to ASSR last time, so uh, sometime in the future I'll have to get you to sign my copy. For others, it's available on Amazon and other booksellers. I'd strongly recommend checking it out. If you have any interest in being very serious in spine intervention, this is a fantastic resource to have. And with that, Dr. Khan, I want to thank you so much. Would you like to share any upcoming events or, or projects or any other final words to our audience? No, thank you very much. Uh, and for all the young trainees that are that are wanting to become spine interventionalist, be it spine interventionalist or hybrid. Uh, there are ways of doing it and just pick up way, whichever way you want to do it. One of the especially easier way to get trained really and see the whole armamentarium that we offer in spine intervention is probably attending uh, American Society of uh, Spine Radiology Conference. We have workshops and we try to showcase almost every procedure that an interventionalist has to offer uh, in spine care. So if you are interested in seeing what is being offered, I think that conference and that workshop is probably a really good way to start and get an idea if you're not really sure about what's being offered and what's not being offered. I definitely second that recommendation. Having uh, been at the, the most recent conference this February, the workshop was fantastic. Uh, just really rapid fire working with phantom cadavers and getting to use all the latest and greatest. It was a really great assortment. And that's to say nothing of the conference itself, which is uh, top notch with diagnostic and interventional sessions. The only difficulty, like we talked about earlier, is there's so much cool stuff, there's there's not enough time to see it all, but I strongly recommend that to any of the trainees interested in this. I think next year in 24 is going to be in Las Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. So, so that'll be a, a lot of fun and look forward to seeing you there and uh, hopefully some of our listeners as well. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure that our audience is going to get a lot of benefit from this topic and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to talk to you myself. Jake, really appreciate it, really appreciate it, and enjoy talking to you about this. Uh, I know it's a passion for you and passion for me, and hopefully passion for a lot of people who are hearing this, and they will dive right into it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, and to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and Digital Marketing, led by Brian Schmitz. Article and Transcript, support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social Media and PR, by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 